I love waking up on a morning like this and it just looks like a mountain. Peaceful. Oh, don't I know it. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to have Lee and Nick go ahead and take a ball for me. I woke up this morning with the word of the goodness of God leads a man to repentance. It led me into the song, He's a Good, Good Father. I've come to find out that's what they're playing today. I had no idea. Holy Spirit's amazing. The goodness of God leads a man to repentance. It's not his wrath. It's not his anger. It's not even the fear of hell. It's his kindness. All my life, I thought God was mad. I thought if I sinned enough, that was it. I was cut out of the kingdom. That he was angry at me and that was it. If God's not good, he would have never sent his son to die for us. But until you get alone with him and let that revelation get formed in you, you'll always hear that he's a good father, but you'll never actually know him as a good father. But there is a difference. The Lord asked me a long time ago, or a while back, he said, what's the greatest breakthrough you have received so far? And I thought about it, and I thought about it. I said, Lord, it would have to be whenever I realized I'm a son, and that's never going to change. I'm always going to be a son. And I started going from there. And the Lord said, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I, said, I don't know what else to tell you. That's the only answer I have. He told me, he said, the greatest breakthrough you have received so far is whenever you see me for who I truly am, a good father, and Almighty God. Most of my children only see me as one or the other. Whenever we don't see Him the way that He truly is, it limits us in the way that we seek Him. It actually puts a veil over our heart because we don't see Him for who He truly is. So I'm going to bless you, and then they're about to just, they're, I've already heard them warming up. It's we had church before y'all got yeah. here. It's not that. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it gets any better when you understand it. Father, I thank you for your love. Yes. God, open our hearts to receive your love today. Let us see you the way that you truly are. That you're an amazing Father yes, you and Almighty God. God, we ask you for great grace in this place, for truth to wash us, and for us to be formed in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
King of my heart 
You're never gonna let me down. Yeah, come on. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. Take it up, come on. And you're
I was wondering uh, what the things that the Lord was telling me. As a matter of fact, even all the way up, I was making notes of the things that the Holy Spirit was just telling me. Uh, 
and how because he, he's so amazing we don't try to sync up and I don't, I don't tell them what to play and what to sing or anything like that so that it goes along with uh, you know what I'm going to talk about or anything like that but the Holy Spirit is so amazing that it all winds up taking place and, and today I, I was uh, listening to what they, they were singing and I'm thinking to myself you know, how, how is that going to tie into what I'm hearing the Holy Spirit? Until that very last part. <laughs> I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And let me tell you a, a little story. When uh, I first started realizing my call uh, in, in the kingdom and the Holy Spirit was just yeah. giving me all kinds of revelations, you know. I didn't have anybody to preach to. I preached to myself, you know. And he's giving me these revelations upon revelation. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this is just so awesome. This truth, you know. And I thought, you know, this is going to be great because one day when you have me start an assembly or to preach or something like that, People are just going to flock to that. They're going to. They're just going to come and because you're, the, the truth of it, you know, they're they're going to want to hear truth, not hear me, hear truth. Right. And the Lord uh, answered me, and He said, "No." no. <laughs> he said, "They crucified me because of truth. Truth is not popular." And I was thinking to myself, this is where the Holy Spirit was talking to me while we were singing, right as we started singing, and I started making notes like crazy, you know, as he was. And uh, he reminded me of something, you know. Um, my wife's uh, uncle, he's, he's retired now, but he used to have a garage in Monroe. He was absolutely, as I understand, phenomenal. He was so good of a mechanic. He could walk up to your car running, listen to it, and tell you exactly what was wrong. <coughs> and she was talking to him one day, and I'll try to reiterate this story as best as I can. You know, he was talking about he, he charged more for people with high dollar cars like Mercedes. But not because that's what he, he was doing, you know, because he was trying to do something wrong to them. People wouldn't come with those cars unless you did that. Because they were so, they believed that, that what they had, at, that unless they were getting charged higher money, they weren't getting quality. And so he had to do that so that he could get the, get business, their business. He wasn't doing it to try to, to to do them wrong in some way. And the Lord reminded me of that. And he said, he, he said, the simplicity of the gospel, because the gospel is simple. It's the simplicity of this. It's so simple, though. That many won't come to hear the simplicity. Now we're talking believers. Won't come to hear the simplicity of the gospel. Because they believe. as he, let, me, let, me, let me say it as he gave it to me. He said people believe that the simplicity of the gospel diminishes its value. That it cheapens it. And so they don't want to come. They want to come to a place that makes it difficult, that teaches steps and programs and methodologies and teaches you that you're not there yet. You do this, do this, do this right here, and you'll start taking steps to get there. And it makes it complicated and hard for the believer. But people come to hear that because they think that if it, it can't be simple, 
because there's no value in it then. Which diminishes and cheapens the work of Christ. They would rather come to a place that says, you're still broken. Take these steps. Do these steps. Follow these steps. And maybe you'll start to work your way into not being broken. Or being complete in Him. Or something. And so what that does is it teaches the believer that you're never what Christ says about you in the Scripture. And what you do is, is that you wind up having to go and, and keep coming back because you're broken. The only way that you're going to get fixed is to be coming there and following whatever steps that you need, right? But the, the reality is, is that you're never taught you're complete. You never reach that end. And what that does is it keeps people coming back in droves because they would rather feel like that they're doing something because the flesh wants to have something to do with salvation. It really does. That's why the simplicity of the gospel, the grace of Jesus Christ being complete in him by his work and his work only, that's why it becomes what... That's why you, you see people that tend to not want to hear that because they, they want to have something that they do too that helps to either attain or to solidify their salvation. When the reality is, is that we are complete in Him by His work. That's in Colossians. You are complete. The simplicity and the gospel is the work has been done he left us a love letter to tell us what we look like, what that nature in us looks like. He, he, he didn't give this to us as a self-help book to take steps to try to get to something. He said, this is what I've done for you already. Now this is what your nature looks like. Let that be what comes out of you. Because if you don't, what you will do is, and this is why you see Christians always, instead of looking like, and I can't say all Christians, but understand, you see a lot of Christians that look like anything but what the Scripture says. Scripture says you're more than conquerors. Most Christians do not look like they're more than conquerors. They look like they're being tossed to and fro by whatever situation and circumstance in life comes out. Scripture says that we are full of joy. I see most Christians looking like they ate prunes before they came. <laughs> and the reason is, is because of the first thing. Circumstances in life tell them who they are and tell them how much God loves them. That's what, how they weigh it. They believe that if my circumstances, if God loves me, my circumstances look good. But if my circumstances doesn't look good, then well, God must not love me or I've got a problem that I need to get straightened out so God will love me and show me this kind of favor that I believe I should get. First Peter 2.21 I don't see you going to it, bro. Right now. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Easy now. Now watch this. Let's start in uh, two eighteen. All right. So he's talking about submission. So household slaves, submit yourself to your masters with all respect. Not only to the good in general, but also to the cruel. For it
it brings favor. If because of conscience toward God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you endure when you sin and are beaten? But when you do good and suffer, you endure it. Brings favor, enduring it brings favor to God. Now listen to this. 21. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. See, people talk about all the time you know, that Christians talk about all the time about what their circumstances look like when we're told that we have been placed in a position that is above our circumstances and irrespective of our circumstances. And he says right here, Peter says, you were called to suffer for the sake of Christ. This is not something you hear in the church. You don't hear people talk about the reason that, that, that you are here is to become loved, but in that you're going to suffer. Doesn't the scripture say that those who would live godly will suffer persecution? He didn't say you might he said, you will suffer persecution if you live godly. But he's talking about here, you know, when you suffer for something that you didn't do, this is what he's talking, the, the purpose of this when he's talking is this suffering because you did something wrong versus suffering because you, and when you really didn't do anything wrong, which is persecution. Right. And he says, you're called to this. This is what you've been called to. So the next time that a believer says, I don't know what I'm called to, you're called to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> That'll win them. But see, when we understand our identity, it doesn't, that has no effect on us. Because we are so settled in his rest that even though we endure persecution, that change doesn't change our view of him. It doesn't change our view of our identity. See, this is the idea, is that your identity is not wrapped up in how your circumstances are, but it's wrapped up in who he is and what he done. he's done for you. That's where your identity is at. And that identity in him is to become loved. See, now, if you're in a, in a place that teaches basically task and um, a set of steps to try to achieve something, if you're in a place like that, then what you're going to do is, is that you're going to think to yourself, sorry, I got distracted. What you're going to do when you have that is that instead of looking at what he's done for you, you're going to only see that you've got steps that you've got to try to do that's going to make your life better. And that is often how it's taught in this church today. The idea becomes if my circumstances the more spiritual I am, the better my circumstances are. And some even get off further into a ditch than that. They even start talking about, well, if you're given this amount of money, then your circumstances will be this and, and better yeah. and all this kind yeah. of stuff because God's going to bless you a hundredfold with money. And That's, that's not even scriptural. Mm -mm. That, that's abuse from con men that, that have taken a truth in scripture and twisted it for their own use. Paul said, I've learned to be content with or without. I mean, who in here would say Paul was not spiritual? <laughs> he sure had some circumstances. Yeah, Paul endured suffering. He endured being beaten. I mean, you think about it. He preached about love and joy. And yet, almost everywhere Paul went and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, he was going to be beaten 
-hmm. abused. People tried to stone him, threw him in prison. I'd say that if, if you took that and put it today, people would go, oh, he was, and, and somebody was doing that. They'd think, okay, well, he's, he's, you know, he's not doing something right with God, with Christ. <laughs> because in our Western culture, it's easy to do that. When you live in freedom, in a freedom of country, that, that is only an attribute that's that for a place that, that you have that comfort zone. Because if you go somewhere else, you go overseas to a place where there is no democracy, there is no freedoms. That's a very real thing. Yeah. Becoming a Christian, getting baptized puts a target on you. You know that you have an incredibly high potential to die for your faith. Yeah. Here, in this country, which is the country, excuse me, of the spoiled, <laughs> we're able to, th and, and because of the religious freedoms that we've had, it's, it's created this relative truth and the idea that we, I need to go and, and, and my life needs to be without any bumps in the road. It needs to be without any hardship. And it takes... And, and, you ever have one of those times where your phone, you can't get the thing to talk back to you, to answer you, but then, <laughs> then whenever you're talking and you don't want it to, there it goes. This is one of those times. <laughs> there's no telling what I'm liable to be done I just turned the sound off on this so I can't hear but she can still hear me there ain't no telling what's liable to be done by the time I finish <laughs> we are to become be so identified with him that we become love see this is the simplicity of the gospel that's what it says in 2 Timothy it says the goal of our instruction is love. It's to become love. See, whenever you're, uh, now I'm not going to try When you're in a place that talks about steps and programs and methodologies, whenever it starts talking about love, it, gets, it teaches you that it, love is a work that you do, as in, I'm going to try to love them. You ever heard somebody say that? You might have even said that. I'm going to try to love them. But if you're trying to love someone, you ain't. Just like if you're trying to forgive them, you hadn't forgiven them. We tell on ourselves. <laughs> now, love in the scriptures is about becoming love. So you got to understand something. When Adam fell, all right, see, when Adam had not fallen yet, he was in perfect communion with perfect love. And in essence, have, he became love also. This is also the reason. See, there's, there's some new people in, in here. Bear with me. I'll, I'm going to say it. This is why man was created in the first place. What God created man because love wants to express itself to someone else. God created man so that he could express himself and his nature to someone else. Adam being perfectly connected to love, becoming love, needed to be able to express himself, his love, to someone else. This is why Eve was created. Not because Adam was lonely. Adam was never lonely. He was in perfect communion with perfect love. He never lacked anything. So whenever Adam fell, he was immediately, the thing that died was the image of God in him. It died immediately. He was cut off from the source of love. And instead of being in communion with perfect love, he became in desperate need of love. Which gave birth to what the world calls love. A needy, selfish, self-centered love. That we call love, but in reality it's not love. But what was the first thing that happened whenever Adam 
fell. Immediately he became selfish and self-aware. Him and that Eve realized, I'm naked. They never had an idea because they were not. Their focus was on perfect love. They never ever realized and understood nakedness. Right. So the moment that they did, that's when the Lord came walking through the garden. Now, who in here thinks that the Lord didn't know where he was? He says, Adam, where are you at? <laughs> okay. He knew where Adam was, right? Adam tells him that he didn't want to come out because he was naked. So the Lord asked him, he says, who told you that you were naked? Still, see, he's asking rhetorical questions because the Lord knows this stuff, right? He wasn't, going, he wasn't walking around the garden going, I know I put him in here somewhere. <laughs> he said, who told you that you were naked? And the Lord said, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Now, that was a straightforward answer, yes or no answer question, right? So now, he is now selfish. This is the birth and seeing the first signs of, of what fallen looks like. Selfishness and self-centered. His idea was not... Yeah, I did. I got my eyes off of what you told me, and I'm sorry that I did that. It was, it was the woman that you gave me. Sounds about right. <laughs> she took the thing and ate it, the fruit, and ate it, and gave it to me. Translated, if you ain't have given me the woman, she would. This none of this stuff would have happened. <laughs> But you see, that's selfish, self-centered, self-preservation. Fallen world. That's what he's doing. This is not love. The first thing he does is blame somebody else for something that he did. To try to get the blame off of him. Even blaming God. Because when he says, if you hadn't have gave me the one... He just pointed his finger back at God and said, this is your fault. And then the Lord went to Eve and said, basically, I'm going to paraphrase, is this true? You gave Adam that to eat? And her answer is, the devil made me do it. The serpent gave it to me. Self-preservation. Selfishness. This is what we get when we're just born, right? Our, our beloved little children, as much as we love them, you never taught them to get angry. You never taught them to be selfish. All you need to do is to take one of their favorite toys away from them when they're six months old. You will find out that they got this from Adam because you did not teach it. They will begin to scream, throw a fit until you give them back what they have. Do I get an amen from any parents in here? Amen. This is the nature that is born. This is why whenever we come to Christ, we have to be born again, again with a different nature. In being born again, what happens is, is that that which was lost, which Jesus came to restore, which is the image of God in man. Man became connected once again to the source of love when you're born again. This is why whenever the Lord is talking about things like he's talking about to husband and wife, and he uses that as to be able to point out 
not only this is how a husband and wife treats each other, but this is my nature, speaking as God. That That is his nature. It says, love is an envious. Love doesn't seek its own. Love believes all things. Love does not keep a wrong, keep count of wrongs done to it. See, this is why is how he's telling the husband and wife to love one another, how they're supposed to love one another. But isn't that the marriage? Is it not, not also what is the closest thing to what Jesus did for the body of Christ? Yes. And say, that's why he says, love your wife the same as Christ loved the church. So he's telling you, this is my nature. And see, if we don't understand identity and understand that this is who we have been made in Him, what we'll do is that we will listen to teachings that try to tell you how to do this in steps. And it's really nothing more than a world methodology that's, been, that's infiltrated the church. Mm. And instead of the church understanding that what they're reading here is not a step-by-step -step instruction... This is the Lord saying, this is the nature that is in you now that you are born again. This is my nature in you. Amen. All right. This is what you need to let come out of you. Not work your way into, but this is who you are. The way that this is, becomes effectual in your life it is based on the fact of you knowing Him. Because He said that's eternal life. Is to know Him and Him who He sent, Jesus Christ. So we know Him and we get to understand in intimacy, this is us. This is who He is and because this is Him, this is what's in us and this is what gets changed in us. But see, what happens is, is that we we try to skip. We, we try to like like we did in school, get the cliff notes. And try to live a life based off of that when we really don't understand what it is that we're reading. We get a bit of knowledge, but we don't get all of it. And it doesn't become revelation to us. And it doesn't change us. And the only way that that happens is intimacy with Him. Because, see, there is a knowledge that is just simply head knowledge. Even if you're a believer, you can read this, never spend any time with him. Now, I'm, when I say spend time with him, because it's almost gotten so cliche when people say that. I mean, really, spend time with your father. In his presence, by yourself. Not on a timer, not going, oh, I need to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes with him. And that's where your focus is. No, it's about knowing him, about spending time with him. And what he does is he takes this and it makes it revelation to you. He brings it, makes it a part of you by his own will, not your will. See, when you don't do that, what you do is that you read this. That's right. <laughs> when you read this, if you don't spend time with him, it is simply head knowledge. And you'll get a ton of head knowledge that where you can recite scripture over and over and over again. But after a while, it'll start condemning you. Because instead of you seeing it where that this is who I am and he's transforming me into this, you'll see it as where you're not. Hmm. And you'll see this gigantic gulf and almost impossibility for you to get to it. See, this is what where it's the meat the, or, or the foundation of our life in Christ that is that you almost never hear taught. It's the intimacy and relationship with Him. And that is the part that actually makes it effectual in your life. 
See, we go around claiming we know Him. In reality, we know of Him. We've never called to know of Him. The Jews knew of Him from Old Testament Scripture. They never knew Him intimately. They knew Him as, as, as Casey said earlier, they knew one side of it. They knew Him as God Almighty. Don't tick Him off because you will become either a pillar of salt or a ash pile, one or the other. Mm. They didn't know Him as a loving Father. We see the loving Father in Jesus who became our true picture of love. We can't live our life as a Christian trying to live out steps to, in order to think that we're going to achieve something. We, we're not climbing Jacob's ladder. We're not taking one step and then another step and then another step. He has already done the work. See, this is why it's so simple, why people have a problem with it. It is so simple that people have a hard time receiving that, the simplicity of it. I've got to do more. There's got to be more to it than this. There's got to be a catch. You ever hear that? Because we hear people say that all the time. That's just too good to be true. There's got to be a catch somewhere. No, there is no catch. This is who he's created you to be. By his finished work. We become love. We don't try to love. We don't try to forgive. Because see, everything is birthed out of love. Out of identity and love. All of that goes together. You know your identity in him, you know you become love. It's, it's impossible to separate the two. And everything is birthed out of love. Does it not say that faith worketh by love? Does it not say that our end goal, the old goal of our instruction is love? The whole purpose of this is to help us understand who we've been made. To it becoming effectual in us walking in it and reproducing him in other people. That is who we are. This is that the his glory be spread throughout the entire world. The glory is who he is spread throughout the entire world. You can't do that, and the devil knows this. You can't do that if you don't understand who you are because your focus will never be on doing what he said because you love him. Your goal, your, your focus will always be internalized trying to keep yourself from sinning, trying to take things, trying to, to take steps in order to deepen your walk with him instead of just spending time with him. And all of that gets taken care of. I mean, think about it. How many times have we ever got up out in the bed in the mornings and the first thing that we start doing is we check, we're doing the checklist in our mind of the do's and don'ts of what we should and should not do today in, with him. Trying to keep myself from sinning. Trying to... I, I shouldn't do that. And I do need to do this. And I do need to do that, right? Instead of just be his. See, you, when, when you're living a list that you're checking off, you're not going to have joy. You can't just be comfortable in, in, in him, having peace and joy, just waking up and being his. 
you're always going to be stressed out because you're thinking in your mind, somewhere in the back of your mind, you're one sin away from getting kicked out of the kingdom or, or however way that you think it. No, it's, it's, we are his. Amen. You are his. You're not having to earn his love. You're not having to earn things from him. He's done this already for us. He wants you to awaken to who you are in him. Who the Son sets free is free, is free indeed. indeed. Right? Do you know what the greatest freedom that you'll ever be from? It's freedom from yourself. Mm. When you get free from yourself, free from your carnal mind, realizing who you are in Him, you won't spend your time trying, worried to death that you're doing something wrong, worried to death that somebody's going to be offended. You're just going to love and you're just going to enjoy being His. That is why he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all of these other things will be added. Did he say you would do it? He said he'd do it. Simple. The simplicity of the gospel. He would have you be free. Freedom we throw out words like that on a regular basis as Christians what we do is that we just we don't get the magnitude of what we're saying and what he's done what we've done is that we have taking stuff because we think that it can't be this simple. And we've made it complicated in our own heads. When the reality is you are complete in him. What does it say in Colossians also? He has made you holy without blemish and above reproach. Yes. He made you that. Not you. Not you earn your way to it. He has. So here, let, let's get this a little clear. You have been made the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, one. Did you have anything to do with that? He has made you holy. He's talking to believers. Did you have anything to do with him making you holy? Mm -mm. See, he, had, he gave me a great revelation one time about holiness. He said, when Moses approached the burning bush, which was him, fire in, in the bush, he said, I told Moses, take off your shoes for the ground that you're walking on is holy. Y'all remember that? He said, if the ground itself became holy just because of my presence, how much more holy are you who I live in? Yes. You've been made holy. Without blemish, that is a reference to sacrificial lambs in the Old Testament. In order for them to be an acceptable sacrifice, they had to have no blemish. So he's made you clean. And the last thing he said, which absolutely should be just phenomenal to us, he said, I have made you above reproach. You know what I understand? That means no one can come and make an accusation against you to him. The accuser of the brethren has no place now 
The only thing he can do is to cause you to believe something that's a lie. But he can't accuse you to the Father. Amen. Now, if you don't know the, the him, I always say this. Most of the time, I, you know, we don't spend too much time here, guys. But it, I, I would feel wrong if I didn't ask this. If, you, if there's anybody here that does not know Christ, raise your hand. I tell you what, we'll do, we'll do it this way. All heads bowed and all eyes closed. If there is somebody here that does not know Christ, I'm not talking about no of him. 